I don't think people take into account uh, what an impact your padding strategy has to kind of the output of a convolutional neural network, especially in the case of encoding. Uh, here, I made this graphical user interface to allow people to get a, a better idea of pa different padding strategies and how they affect receptive fields. So you can, you'll can you have access to this code. I'll post this on my GitHub. Uh, but I'll explain kind of what's going on and what all the stuff is here. So this is the code that kind of generates this output. So we have a, a time series classification here. Uh, we have th these green points that are kind of grayed out or is this time series kind of represented in this kind of line dot formation. These gray ones are the, the padding that's added using the same uh, padding strategy. And that's what you need for this kind of, like, kind of convolution to happen uh, without kind of losing any data. And then there would be some sort of convolution that takes place in between these kind of rows. And then this is the output. And then these grays here are the padding that happens before this convolution that goes here and then so on. These kind of uh, lines that are connecting here are showing you the receptive field of each neuron here on the kind of encoded layer. So you can slide it back and forth. And the reason I made this is I was really trying to push the performance of a model that I used for uh, missile warning. And we were really trying to get very, very high performance. And there was kind of some cap using kind of like our, our encoding strategy. We needed to encode before we pass this information to a transformer to kind of condense it. Um, but what was happening was we couldn't really pr push performance, but I kind of analyzed the, the padding strategy and found some ways to kind of improve the performance. Uh, so I'll kind of go over different ones. And the reason that I think uh, pa same padding is overused is obvious out of like convenience. Uh, I think same, a lot of times like same padding is very good if you need to keep dimension, if you need to not like lose data as far as shape wise, or if you, your model's so deep that condensing it down is like really negatively effective. And also there's some sort of loss on the edges that can kind of occur if your convolution is not allowed to see the edge multiple times at like different points in the kind of kernel. Um, so there are some ups to, to same padding, but there are also some like negative sides that I want to go over. Uh, and this kind of user interface allows us to do that. We can select what layer we kind of look at different like parts of the receptive field, so on. And I'll kind of get in more detail. Uh, but first, I just want to take you through a couple examples. So we'll move this up here and then I will go to select 25 for the number of samples we have. So 25 means that's the length of this sort of time series here. Our kernel size, five. So that's the fanning out of these, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, we have our stride, three. Number of layers is two. So we have a convolutional layer here, a convolutional layer here, and we have three output nodes. Okay, so we're using same padding here. There's some interesting things that happen with same padding with this setup. You'll notice that this first node here, this the output of this kind of encoding, uh, sees only 36% of the trend compared to the second node uh, here that sees 68% uh, of the trend. And as you go for the next one, it sees around 60%. So you can see some there's disparity in kind of uh, what each node sees and maybe the, the kind of uh, value that each node might have. Uh, if you think examples over here, if you look at, we're looking at this side, this node is heavily influenced by zero values, which can be kind of bad, especially when zero values might mean something to your data. If you're kind of passing before that batch norm layer uh, and you're you're looking at kind of uh, zero values that matter, my, my application they did for where we had kind of these impulsive sort of signals where it's zero a lot and then kind of goes up. So the zeros had a kind of a lot of, carried a lot of meaning and you're diluting that a lot. If you kind of have this sort of area, it makes it kind of less effective to be able to kind of tell that difference and the kernels are probably avoiding kind of searching for those zeros because it's getting these kind of faults or kind of just padded non-zeros. And then also if you think, this is a kind of three, so this is kind of unrealistic, but it's just good for an example. But let's say we encoded down to a space and then did some sort of max pooling it kind of would weight these two kind of similarly, and they're not. This one is seems to be a lot more valuable in terms of what it's seeing and how much information it can kind of contain in sort of its receptive field. And you could be combining them. Uh, but if this was a bit layer, larger and needed some sort of max pooling, there could be some issues there where you're kind of diluting your signal. Obviously, there's a lot of issues with valid as well. Uh, I can switch to this one and you can kind of see uh, some issues 
with valid. So valid would only go down to one uh, point here. Uh, this is just an example, but valid will, if it doesn't have enough room to complete the next kind of uh, convolution, it won't go. So if it gets down to this area, it won't do another one. It won't be able to, and this one will have no receptive field of this entire portion of the trend. So valid kind of has this issue where you don't always know it's looking at everything unless you really kind of look at how the padding strategy affects kind of the model. But it can be very good in certain cases. Uh, it really depends on your application, what you're looking for. But I would definitely say if you're always using kind of the same padding, uh, there's probably an issue or, or uh, you probably could improve model performance a lot of your models if you kind of looked at other padding strategies. So for this setup, you get a very kind of clean sort of sort of padding or, or sort of uh, effect when you're in kind of encoding where they're all kind of equal. They all see 38.6% uh, of the trend and you can kind of see how it kind of kind of very cleanly goes down. And this can be very good for a lot of applications. Obviously there's some good stuff uh, with same padding uh, that could allow the model to see these kind of multiple times. But sometimes diluting the, the points with zeros can be very uh, negatively uh, impact your model. So we can look at same padding for the same sort of effect here. You have this one node that sees 20% and it sees a lot of, of padded values as it goes down, mixes a lot here. This one is influenced you know, almost half by, by just padded values. And you can just kind of see how that changes as you slide across. Um, but I, I just think it's kind of interesting kind of seeing this and kind of being able to kind of visualize what might be happening within a uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, and I also wanted to kind of go over uh, some kind of literature kind of review and different padding strategies. I'm sure if you're seeing this, this is kind of probably annoying to you. Uh, this is kind of like, you, if you're into machine learning, you'll see this, this GIF, I think the same GIF like thousands and thousands of times. But I'll go quickly over some kind of quick points about different padding. You obviously have like a constant padding. You can pad with any value. And this kind of goes back, in certain cases, you may want to avoid zero padding. Usually not. It's better for the matrix multiplication because it has the least effect on kind of downstream uh, anyway. They have a reflection padding, which is kind of interesting, where you, if you have this original signal, you can see it reflects. It's in the name, so not really much to go into there. Uh, replication padding, pretty easy as well. You input one, two, three, it repeats the one on the left, repeats the one on the right. So there could be some good things there, but you'll almost never see these used. Um, but going back to my sort of application, I was looking at trying to really push performance of time series classification. And there's this uh, inception time, uh, finding Alex, Alex net for time series classification. So I found this kind of uh, paper very interesting. Uh, it uses uh, incept this kind of like a funny name. Uh, I, I don't know really know if I like the name, but it just implies these inception blocks for time series. Uh, I would kind of encourage you to look into that. I, I was able to get a lot of performance out of that. They drew this. This is kind of signified what I showed you with that graphical user interface before, where you have some original time series condenses down with some sort of convolution, which gets even further condensed down to this point, and this sees some sort of receptive field of the time series. They talk about how they kind of leveraged uh, really large kernels to be able to maximize this receptive field. Uh, but there are a lot of trade-offs with like really large kernel sizes with the kind of very high amount of padding you, you have to have. And I don't think people talk about that sort of thing enough. Uh, another thing was this paper that came out which is receptive fields, understanding the effect of receptive fields in deep convolutional neural networks. This paper is very interesting. It kind of shows uh, some points about how the receptive field is kind of generated uh, and kind of uh, viewing how this kind of effective receptive field is kind of like uh, visually kind of viewing it and how it's affected by activations. They found that the ReLU activation kind of uh, the nonlinearity of it kind of decreased the receptive fields. So you're seeing a little bit less of the area. So these are all images and it's showing that the model is focusing on this kind of sort of center area. So it's receptive field. It's kind of ignore, ignoring a lot of the outside. And that could be due to kind of what we talked about with the zero padding, this sort of thing where you're diluting information. It could not, you kind of have to kind of 
do take it by case by case, but certainly if you're just using the same padding kind of blindly because it's easy, you could probably get a lot of performance uh, by ch switching it up or trying something a little bit different there. This shows the receptive field before chaining for CFAR10. So CFAR10, yeah, I mean, everyone knows the data set. It's got a bunch of different images of cars. 10 is for 10 different items. So you have like cars, airplanes, birds, frogs, horses, deer, some other things. Uh, so this is the receptive field before training and after you can kind of see how it kind of grows and it's kind of looking to the outside. One thing I kind of think is interesting that they didn't really talk about here is that, yeah, the receptive field is in the center and it kind of gassingly goes out, but you know, how, how much is that due to the model or due to the fact that just the way people take photos and the way that the CFAR 10 data set is kind of curated, a photo of a deer will have the deer in the center of the photo. So is the is the receptive field kind of focusing to the inside because it has this kind of natural bend and maybe padding's affecting it and this sort of thing? Or is it just part of being an artifact of the data set? So you don't really know. I imagine it's a mix of both. But I'd be interested in seeing if you uh, positioned all the targets kind of upper left or something a little bit different. If that kind of changed this sort of receptive field that you see here where it's focusing further out or if you made sure that they're all on the outside or kind of mixed up things, how does that change the receptive field? Uh, but anyway, I have this sort of uh, user interface that you can play with different things and get an idea of what, you know, different padding strategies affects this sort of receptive field and kind of just in general how a receptive field kind of works. And just to kind of get you thinking about how it could impact your model, because there's a lot of stuff that you could do with you know different transformers layers that you usually are fed into, uh, kind of the by these kind of encoders. Uh, kind of understanding kind of what came from the encoder, this thing I think is very important. And uh, I'll post this on my GitHub page. There'll be a link kind of in this video.